More on the year's top tech stories with Ken Ray. This is Mac Voices. This edition of Mac Voices is supported by Text Expander by Smile, the makers of world class software. Visit TextExpander.com slash podcast to learn more and download your free demo. This edition of Mac Voices is supported by Headspace. Meditation made simple. Visit headspace.com slash macvoices for a free one-month trial. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, we're wrapping up 2021 and starting off 2022 with a discussion with Ken Ray of Mac OS Ken about some of the top tech stories of 2021. In the first part, we talked about uh, COVID-19 and what it meant for Apple, as well as everybody else. Um, and also started a an extended discussion of what Ken termed imaginary products, um, the Apple Car and the Metaverse. We continue with the Metaverse part of the conversation here and then get into more of this year's top stories. Let's go back and hear from Ken. You brought up the, uh, an interesting comparison or contrast between AR and VR. Do you think AR can mm-hmm. be... It, it, should it be considered part of the metaverse, part of a metaverse concept, or can it be a gateway into a metaverse concept? Sure, why not? <laughs> I'm sorry, not to be, I mean, not to be a cavalier about it, but why not? Like, can you and I, Jeff Gamut and I were joking. I think it was during the COVID thing um, initially about all right. See, the thing is, even when it's not COVID, Jeff Gamut and I don't live anywhere near each other. We're a minimum of, I want to say, 1,100 miles, maybe 1,500 miles. That's not court ordered. That's just how it works out. <laughs> we're very far away from each other. And we were talking, yeah, it'd be neat to be able to sit and watch a movie together. Okay, well, how would you do that? Well, what if you have a LiDAR thing that's like a, like an orb in your room, right? And the LiDAR thing reads my room, reads Jeff's room, so it reads Jeff, and it reads me, and it figures out where it should put Jeff in my space, and it figure out, figures out where it should put me in Jeff's space. And that's going to get messed up the second I you know, get up to go for a snack or something, but we could theoretically approximate the two of us sitting someplace. And, and this is very much like you know science fiction head thinking, but that's all technology that exists, so it seems like refined it might be able to do that. So now take Jeff out and put in Thor, right? Or put in whoever the guide is for whatever Facebook's metaverse is or whatever the character is from whatever, you know, book or movie that you want to hang out with. Uh, AR could certainly be that because what I want to do is look around my living room and look over and there's Brie Larson or, you know, I, it was the first celebrity I could think of and I don't know why and we can revisit some that sometime if you want to. I mean... You could put fiction, I mean, once you have AR, you can put fiction or fact in front of you, and it can exist in your own world, theoretically. So sure, it can be It can be a, a, a gateway into the metaverse. It could also just be how you experience the metaverse. You might not even need two point on a virtual headset. My assumption is at some point, the same pair of glasses is going to do all of it. It's going to be a while, I think, but, you know, why not? So says Ken Ray. So you know. That what do I know? I don't know. There. <laughs> we're all making stuff up. <laughs> Aren't we? I mean, until somebody hands us something, we're all making stuff up. Yeah, it would be great if it was this. I mean, I assume that somebody's idea of how it's going to go will be based on people's expectations, too, right? If we all think it's going to be one thing and somebody gives us something else, we're just not going to use it. If we all think it's going to be one thing, somebody's going to try to figure out how to give us that one thing, I would think. And then they might slowly move us towards what they actually want to do, but it's got to start with something that we're either, it's either going to start with something that we're kind of expecting or that's going to blow us away so much we had no idea that that's what we wanted. Go back to the iPhone. I couldn't have envisioned the iPhone. I was insistent to myself that if it didn't have a physical QWERTY keyboard, any phone was useless because my thinking was it was either going to be a full QWERTY keyboard or it was going to be a T9 which I always found you know, was absolutely terrible. So I thought, well, it's got to have a full physical keyboard. And then Apple came out with something that was nothing like what I expected, but you know, absolutely blew me away. Now, you can say they approximated a QWERTY keyboard. You're not wrong. But I could not have anticipated 
I could have anticipated and I did anticipate some of the functions, but I couldn't have anticipated the form factor and they came out and they blew it away. So I think the metaverse either has to look like what we expect or it has to be so mind blowing that, you know, we'll forget what we thought we were going to get because we'll be so happy with what we have. We, we've had this discussion endless times and I know you've had it with other people and I've had it with other people that, you know, so many things stem, we, we think, or it seems from Star Trek, but definitely from science fiction that, you know, mm-hmm. it, it, and it wasn't quite right, but it was close enough that it inspired someone to say, this is a direction we go. And that's kind of where mm-hmm. I think the the AR and VR thing right now is that some of the some of these works of fiction, because say what you will about most science fiction writers, but I think they give a lot of thought to what they do, and they they try to project. Okay, how would something like this work that could genuinely, honest to God, be useful? And then mm-hmm. the real world catches up and says, okay, well, this this idea you got this right, but you didn't get this right over here. And so we got to tweak that. But at the end of the day, you end up with something, you know, very similar, uh, in, at least in general concept. I feel like that's where we are now. And the question is, how can they deliver on, on a, a close approximation to that? And then what will the second generation look like based on our idiosyncratic use of it? Yeah, I'm really excited to find out. I know I just said a few minutes ago that I'm really happy that my um, – next Mac will be more powerful than the first round of M1 Macs because, you know, it's going to take me that long. As long as it's not completely cost prohibitive, I will ju- I will have the first, what will end up being crappy AR, VR, whatever thing Apple, you know, offers. And it'll be great compared to everything else when they offer it, but then two years later, it'll be antiquated. I'm thinking about the first uh, iPad specifically. First iPad was mind-blowing. It was amazing. And the second iPad was so much better than the first iPad. And the third iPad was way <laughs> better than the first iPad. And then, you know, I didn't feel stupid because I had actually already gotten the second one and passed the first one on to somebody else. But, um, yeah, it's going to be – it's probably, even by Apple standards, going to be a little clunky and a little kludgy. But it's going to be okay because I think part of it is about getting developers on board anyway for when they finally get something, you know, sexy that you can walk around with, classes that – look almost like this uh, that you can just walk around outside with and developers will have been developing in anticipation of that for a very long time is my guess fun stuff to think about fun stuff to think about it is it is tremendous amount of fun to think about so what's your third uh big news story for 2021 uh uh, well, well, let me let me do a, a quick caveat and say um, I I don't know if it's actually a big one, but it's the big one for me. Um, what I what I said at the Silicon Valley Mac User Group is you could have had a bunch of different people on and com- probably had a bunch of different stories as the most important. There are going to be a lot of people for whom the Racial Equity and Justice Initiative was the biggest story of the year because it's going to have changed their lives. Um, you could argue that virtual WWDC two years in a row is huge because it takes the number of people who can participate from a few thousand to a few hundred thousand or as many people as want to. Um, I chose Apple TV plus because of the stuff that they're doing as far as the content. I took it to heart when Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs, I took it to heart when uh, Tim Cook stood up on stage at that announcement and said, great stories can change the world. And what's interesting is not everything that they're doing is a story that's going to change the world, I don't think, but they're doing a lot of stories that potentially can. Um, They won Peabody's this year for Ted Lasso and for uh, Stillwater. Um, They won a Peabody last year for uh, Emily Dickinson, uh, Dickinson. the uh, the one uh, with Haley Steinfeld about uh, poet Emily Dickinson. They have brought representation uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the movie Coda, hiring you know deaf actors to portray a deaf family and burning the subtitles into the print so that, funny enough, this you know film about uh, about people uh, who are deaf. 
uh, you don't have to treat the people who are going to see it who are also deaf, uh, especially, right? The subtitles are there, so there's no there's no barrier, and that's that was a that was a big move, and that was a surprising move, and it's surprising that that would be a big move, and yet you know it's not the kind of thing that most of us think about because most of us aren't deaf, and most of us don't have uh, people who are deaf in our lives. Um, or deal with them, you know, on a consistent basis. They're, they're, the stories that they are telling that have the potential to change people's lives, uh, to me, are the biggest thing. And that's a very personal thing because, you know, a lot of people may watch Ted Lasso and think, well, that's fun, and then go off and watch something else. That's largely what I do. I find it thought-provoking. I like it a lot. Um, I don't know that Ted Lasso has changed my life, and yet I have a friend who watched Ted Lasso because I wouldn't stop talking about Ted Lasso. And he actually does feel like that show changed his life. I don't know if it was forever. I don't know if he still walks around, you know, thinking that. But in the immediate aftermath, he found himself being more empathetic. He found himself telling people that he appreciated them. He found himself, you know, like really thinking about what he was going to say before he said it because he didn't want to be you know, off the cuff and hurt somebody's feelings. And that's crazy because because it's a goofy TV show that was based on a character from a commercial, right? And yet they're not wrong. When Apple says great stories can change the world, they can. Ted Lasso is especially weird because I think about things like, I know people who love The Expanse, but I don't think it hit every corner of society. I know people who love Game of Thrones. I don't think it hit every corner of society. It was huge, but I, I, I can't think of a show like Ted Lasso, especially today when there are you know thirty different streaming um, uh, options, <laughs> and when there are just so many so many different silos for content at this point. That one seemed to really kind of reach out in ways that that. I was certainly surprised by. I would imagine that Apple was surprised by it as well. Um, and then see also Stillwater. It's a, it's a show that's trying to teach mindfulness techniques to children. It's it's trying to teach children how when they get panicked or when they get upset, how they can calm themselves and center themselves. And where was that when I was a kid? <laughs> because <laughs> that would have been a neat thing to have. Um, I mean, there it's uh, the stuff that they're trying to do with Apple TV Plus is is exciting um and so that that ends up being my personally my biggest story but that's you know probably largely because for the past two years mostly what i've been doing is going to the grocery store coming home working and you know watching tv so if you had asked me two years from now it might be a different story or you know if we weren't all inside this whole time it might be a different story but that ends up being my biggest for the year or one of my biggest for the year I'm not even going to try to go back over everything you just said because it, it, you were very eloquent with the reasons, the, the, the messages that all those shows have or meant to you and mean to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, I know I've I've been surprised at how much Apple TV I've enjoyed. Um, Te- Tehran was one that, you know, I was, I don't know what I thought or what I expected, but what I got out of it was, that, you know, I had to read subtitles about 70, 80% of the time, which is not a bad thing, yeah. you know. Um, right now I'm working my way through Dr. Brain, which is uh, basically you can either do subtitles or you can do the, you know, the uh, the dub in, the audio dub. Um, yeah. Because yeah. if I listen to Korean, I won't know what's going on. But I have this funny feeling that Apple is doing, you know, they're, they're just doing these quiet little experiments that – that I'm not sure anybody is really zooming in on the fact that they're doing all these experiments and so many of them are working at different levels and maybe not for everyone, but they are working. And so I, I, I see Apple TV as a, as a much bigger success than a lot of folks do because I don't think that they're going for quantity. Everybody wants to measure the number of subscriptions and the amount of revenue being generated. And, oh, my God, they need a back catalog. Not sure they do. I mm-hmm. feel like it's, it's, it's. Forgive me. It's an apple in an orange world, um, and you know everybody seems to think that the oranges out there, you know, they have all those characteristics. Apple doesn't fit in that mold, so therefore, that eh, must not be a success. 
There was an article uh, right, I think, one, the a month or two after Apple TV Plus launched that, that said if you look at the cost-benefit analysis, uh, Netflix is definitely a better deal than Apple because Netflix shows are like 0.015 cents or something. Or, and, and, and for Apple, it was about 45 cents a show. Because they had so few shows at that time. So just, you know, pound for pound, as if that's the way you watch TV, Netflix is a better deal. And my argument was, if you find one thing on Apple TV Plus that speaks to you, that that's your four ninety nine right there. And at the time, I don't think we had seen enough to know whether there would be anything that would actually speak to us that way. But it's, it's ridiculous to think in terms of... Um, how much you know how much content there is to watch because unless you don't do anything else at this point there's almost too much apple tv plus content to watch plus going into 2022 their hope um it was reported i don't think it's stated but it's reported their hope is to have at least one new title a year um and i don't think that is just like hey here's season four of uh of uh, for all mankind or whichever season they'll be on I don't think it's just here is new content from the same thing. As I understand it, they're hoping for one new title a, a week for a year. And so that's 50 new, 52 new things by the end of the year. And if that's not enough for you, I mean, then you've still got Hulu and you've still got Netflix and you've still got Disney+. Plus. I know. I have them all. And I constantly <laughs> think about you know getting rid of half of them because I'm, not, I'm watching like three shows and I've got four streaming channels. Tell me why that is. But... Um, yeah, it's there. It's you and I, and I think Mark Fuccio talked when Apple bought Beats. You had read some story that you thought that there was a poss or that said that there was a possibility that Apple might one day get into video. And I was like, cool, why not? Because they've got enough money. Let's see what happens. I like the fact that having enough money and doing that, they seem to be guided. And, you know, I feel certain, like I said before, not everything is going to fit into that great stories can change the world thing. But some things do. Um, have you watched Little America? No. On Apple TV Plus? Little America is was especially, I think, good um, during the last administration when people who came from other lands, which, quick reminder, we all did at one time. But it was a good uh, when uh, when people who came from other lands were being more readily vilified um, in American society, and I don't think that's gone away. But what's great about Little America is it was all these people, it was all these stories of immigrants to the U.S., and they weren't all opened their own business and you know pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps. They, they were human stories about human beings who you know whose first language was Korean or who you know guy who came from an African nation. He was here studying, and they're all based on true stories. He was here and he was studying, and while he was here studying, the government in his nation collapsed. And his immediate thought was, I have to go home. I have to take care of people there. And the people there were like, dude, stay there. You can, you can do better taking care of us from there. Uh, they've been fascinating stories. They're incredibly, um, th they're told in very entertaining ways. Not everyone is going to be for everybody, but there, there's such heart there. Um, unfortunately, they haven't been able to do a season two yet because because of its international nature, uh, they are doing a lot of filming in other countries as well, uh, which has been kind of tough in times of COVID. But that's sort of like, a, if you pardon my use of the term, that's sort of a little show that I think has sort of gone under the radar. Uh, I would argue it's one of the most important shows they've done to this point just because just because they you know show the humanity of humans even if they're not the even if they're not the kind of people that you normally uh, know or hang out with so yeah that, I think it's I think it's one of the it's it's one of the most obvious things that Apple is doing and uh, and potentially one of the best this edition of Mac voices is supported by text expander by smile do more with just a few keystrokes with text expander with so many of us working from home now, at least part-time, if not full-time, we're having to do a lot of things just a little different. That can be good, it can be a challenge, sometimes both at once. That means taking a look at how we're doing things and trying to be more efficient and more consistent. 
That's why Text Expander from Smile is at the top of my list when I need to try to figure out how to do things just a little bit better. Text Expander can help me do a whole lot with just a few keystrokes. Maybe it's as simple as putting in a mailing address by typing in two or three characters. Maybe it can be as untime consuming as putting in regularly used texts into an email, a Slack message, or a Teams message. Again, just a few keystrokes can drop in paragraphs of information. Even better, though, is that whatever information we're talking about, it's always the same, always correct every single time, so that not only am I saving time, I'm being sure that it's right. That's important for me as an individual, but it can be critical if you are managing a team and want that kind of consistency each and every time. I can't stress enough how much I want you to visit textexpander.com slash podcast right now Find out more about what Text Expander can do for you, and then download a free demo to see for yourself. TextExpander.com slash podcast and start making your workflows more efficient today. Thanks to Smile for being the longest running sponsor of Mac Voices. Today's edition of Mac Voices is supported by Headspace. Headspace is meditation made simple. Ever feel like your mind doesn't have an off switch? Or the tension is constantly traveling through your body? Or do you feel tired no matter how much you sleep? That's just a few of the ways stress, anxiety, and sleeplessness can harm your mind and body. This year, why not make small changes to your daily routine that have a big influence on your mental health and well-being? Start your year with Headspace. Whether you want to relieve stress and anxiety, sleep better, or improve your focus, Headspace is your everyday dose of mindfulness for real life. In fact, A recent study proved in just two weeks, Headspace can reduce your stress by 14%. If you look up 2021 in the dictionary, you're likely to find stress as a synonym. Headspace can help you start 2022 right. Why not get started with one of their mini meditations, mini unwind or mini breathe? They are an excellent way to introduce yourself to the benefits of Headspace. However you're feeling, try Headspace at headspace.com slash macvoices and get one month free of their entire mindfulness library. This is the best Headspace offer available, so go to headspace.com slash macvoices today. Headspace.com slash macvoices. Thanks to Headspace for their support of Mac Voices. And the only thing I might disagree with you on on obvious, because as I said, we all know the the big budget productions like Foundation, Um, but there's some, Mm -hmm. and frankly, there were shows you mentioned there in your opening comments about this that I was like, I don't remember seeing that. I got to go back and see, you know, and check that out. Um, there, forgive me when I forgive me really quickly. When I say yeah. obvious, I don't mean like, Oh, well we can obviously tell what they're doing. I mean, they're literally showing you something, right? Like oh, when Tim oh. Cook sits there and says, Oh, uh, you know, dealing with automobiles. I mean, certainly a car is like a computer on wheels and that solves a big computing problem. It's like, okay, he's being cagey. Apple TV is Apple TV Plus is literally very obvious because they're like, look here, <laughs> right? I mean, everything that they're doing is is literally happening on screen. So I apologize if I meant, no, oh, it's obvious this is going to be world changing. I mean, it's one of the only things that they're not cagey about at all. And but but they're also not walking us down the path of this is what we're doing and pay attention to it. They're just they're putting it out there. True, and you know yes. that's where. That's where I find it intriguing that you know some some people. And, oh boy, that's really not fair. I, some people see it as maybe not as big a success as I think you and I see it. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, mm-hmm. they want those people want a back catalog, they want subscriber numbers, and they you know they want things that are maybe a bit more flashy. And and I like flashy, but there also yeah. there's, there's also a lot to be said for. Something's a little deeper or a little more, I don't know, maybe not yeah. generally appealing. Yeah, and plus dig into the back catalog of some of these things, and it's a lot of, it's a lot of crap that was easy to get. I don't, mean to, I'm, I don't mean to be rude about it, but a lot of it is like old movies that you would never watch. And I'm an old movie fan, but I mean, they're old movies that nobody would ever watch. But it's easy for Amazon to say we have, you know, however many hundreds of thousands of things because some of them are just like bad copies of old movies. And like, like I tried to watch Meet John Doe the other day, questionably a Christmas movie because it takes place around Christmas. It's a wonderful Frank Capra film, Barbara Stanwyck, uh, Gary Cooper, Walter Brennan, 
I can't remember who else, but uh, people that you would know if you watch a bunch of old Frank Capra movies because he used a lot of the same people. And their quality, the quality of the copy that they have is crap, but it's one of the, you know, however many hundreds of thousands that they have. Um, so, you know, again, dollars for dollars, you might say, well, Amazon's a better deal, but if half the stuff is stuff you would never watch, well, that takes out half of it right there. Uh, same sort of thing for Paramount Plus. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot, whatever. I'm not, I, I don't mean to like bag on those. A, a back catalog isn't necessarily everything it's cracked up to be, I guess is what I'm, is what I'm thinking. And, uh, and also Apple does not have, with the exception of maybe Tehran in um, Israel, and whatever show it is that they have that's coming out of Russia, I can't remember the name of it now, Container, maybe. Those shows are being produced for those countries, and Apple is attaining the rights every place else. The smart thing about Apple only doing originals is they don't have to worry about, oh, well, we have this deal in Europe, so we can't show that there, but we can show this over here. You know, When Apple puts out a press release, with the exception of Tehran, where they say it's available on whatever streaming service it's on in Israel and available on the rest of the world on Apple TV+. Plus. Uh, this show is available on whichever Russian network it is and available on the rest of the world on Apple TV+. Plus. Going with things that they can just get the rights to outright is super smart because I don't know if you kept up with what was happening with Star Trek this year, but uh, Prodigy, I think it was, is a show that because it's produced with Nickelodeon and there's some deal with Nickelodeon in the European market, the show that's being produced by CBS, and CBS actually has a streaming service in Europe, uh, they can't show that there because of this other deal they have with Nickelodeon, which, by the way, is also owned by the same company, but because of the licensing, whatever. And if Apple had the James Bond back catalog, okay, well, we have it for here, but do we have it for Australia, or does somebody else have it for us? Nuts to that. In five years, they're going to have so much content, it's going to be like every other service out there, and you won't miss not being able to watch Bad News Bears on Apple TV Plus <laughs> because you'll be too busy watching the Ted Lasso reunion or, you know, whatever thing. And so much of this, Ken, to me, is is very much in character with Apple because they want to control the whole widget. And so they're gonna they're gonna have control of all this material. They also can afford to be patient. And, you know, they're just they're doing this slowly. They're building it up. And I'm with you in five years um, it's going to be a Sherman tank that's going to be tough to stop. You know, it, it really is. Yeah. And the one thing that I always, I always feel obligated to bring up, they have been brilliant about saying four ninety nine price point. You know, it's it's the kind of mm-hmm. price point that you forget about that you you know nine ninety nine. I'm going to take a look at it and say, yeah, am I getting am I getting my value out of it? At four ninety nine, I mean, that's that's less than lunch. You know, most most yeah. of the time, and so you know, I yeah, I'll stick it around. Yeah, I'm I'm watching Foundation. I'm watching one or two others, and if I really sit down and do an analysis, I'm really watching more than I realize. But if as long as I've got a, a tent pole or two that are applicable to me, I'm going to stick with mm-hmm. it. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the four ninety nine price point is absolutely is amazing. It's weird to me that they are. Producing and giving me uh, found well giving uh, for the four ninety nine uh, foundation Ted Lasso uh, for all mankind the movies that they're coming out with which is going to include that um, Killers of the Flower Moon uh, the uh, Martin Scorsese directed Robert De Niro uh, Leonardo DiCaprio star uh for less than they're giving me Apple Music I mean because that floor I think has been set by the label so it's nine ninety nine. Almost whoever you go to for music, and for considerably less than that, they're out producing their own content, and they may be taking a bath on that. But you know, Apple can afford to take a bath because uh, how much did I pay for my iPhone, and I'll be paying that again in two years. You know, so <laughs> if it ends up being something that costs a bit, um, yeah, I mean, maybe they're not making the money back on Apple TV Plus, except you know they are in many ways, including the societal ones that we talked about. Well, my last one is not exactly an Apple story, and it sort of crosses over with a whole lot of stuff we've been talking about here, and it's the whole work from home thing. That mm. I feel like the world has changed. Um, some people don't like it, and some people desperately want to go back to the old way. I don't think we're ever going back there um, because there, there are too many people that are adopting this as a way to do it. Now, 
I understand that you know the folks that work in warehouses can't work from home. You know the people that put cars together mm-hmm. can't work from home. But there's a lot of a lot of work that can be done from home, and people a lot of people like it. Not everybody. I know I know several people that you know they want to go back to an office for at least part of the week. But there are a lot of people mm-hmm. that are just fine working at home, and. I think that Apple has benefited from this. I think Apple will continue because we, you and I are, well, we're definitely biased, but I have not heard anybody say, boy, I can't wait to get a new Dell, um, you know, to work from home. But I do yeah. know people that have said, you know, okay, I had to, I needed to buy a computer to work from home. Like you said, they had a, either something crappy that their, their office would give them, or they had something old and it was good enough for home, but not full time. Some people had to buy multiple devices um, because of having kids at home and doing homeschooling. And so much of so many of the people I know went with Apple devices. A- admittedly, they know I'm an Apple guy, so they're going to tell me about it. But I, I feel right. like there were enough of them that had no idea, and they they went the Apple direction. I wish. I wish I had paid attention to this being one of your topics because I would have looked up the Jamf numbers. Because every now and then, Jamf, uh, of course, they're the mobile device management firm that you know they do Apple deployments for. Is it medium-sized businesses or big businesses? I can't remember off the top of my head. But they do, they do deployments, and they every three months or so come out with numbers about how much time they save with Apple deployments as opposed to. Uh, as opposed to Windows-based deployments, like how much less time uh, people have to spend with IT. Like a lot of times they can just call IT and IT can say, just do this, or they might even be able to solve it on their own. And then if they actually have to go to a place where IT actually has to take possession of the machine, uh, they're keeping it much less time because it's that much easier to fix. Uh, There's always an amazing number of the number of people they need in... In a in a place that's um, hybrid, uh, the number of IT people they need for the Windows side is usually significantly more than the people they need for the Apple side, and all that. I mean, all that you know sort of trickles to home, I would guess. Plus, there's. I mean, I think I mentioned this earlier. Once you realize that you're going to be staring at this computer for a while, you might be willing to spend you know a few more dollars because. Your computer is not just the thing that you do the dumb stuff for when you get home from work and use whatever computer they have there. This is now going to be uh, the center of things. The way that it has been for me, obviously, since 2006, 2006, 2007, and the way it, it tends to be for you, I know, when you're away from work. I'm curious. when you, Well, you don't, you're not at work anymore. I assume you're working from home now. Well, I'm working from home, yep. Yeah. When, when you were going to the office, were you... Were you Windows at the office, Mac at home, or have you been Mac all the way all the time? No, I'm. I um, did a transition at the office, and we were we are one hundred percent Mac. Um, oh, okay. You know, and, oh, that's cool. And, yeah, and it's it it saved more than a little bit of money on the uh, on the IT budget um, because I can do most everything, and also Apple machines just don't break. We just don't have problems with them just the way it is well now you say that and well you say that and now i'm worried that both of our machines are going to break tonight so well, yeah, if sure. anything happens <laughs> it's my fault i'll blame you it's, yeah send yeah. me the bill yeah 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 I, I i don't know i mean i just i feel like that and well on iphones too i mean iphones have become if it's possible to become more ubiquitous than they were i think they have during the pandemic and mm-hmm. you know i i don't I know Tim Cook has said, you know, uh, at different times that, you know, as new devices came out, you know, well, this percentage of these devices are from switchers, you know, are people moving over. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he's ever said that about phones because I think it's a bit harder to track. But at the same time, mm-hmm. you know, the fact that Apple had to cannibalize iPads to build iPhones to sell during a pandemic, I think it says something. Yeah, it, it's really been, yeah, it's fascinating. The question that I was asking Adam the other day, uh, Adam Christensen, was how do you even tell anymore when there is a super cycle or when there's a surge in iPhone adoption? Because according to you, uh, Wedbush analyst Daniel Ive, 
According to Wedbush analyst Daniel Ive, there are close to a billion iPhones out there. In any given year, a third of them are ripe for an upgrade because people are holding onto their phones longer. And so you get something like now where 5G is getting, you know, more uh, ubiquitous. Are people buying iPhone 13 because, well, there's 5G and they're excited about 5G, which some people say is happening, or are people buying iPhone because, you know, it's time for the next phone? Combine that with Apple's ability to deliver back to where we started during the time of COVID-19 in ways that other phone makers have not been able to because they are not the largest customer for TSMC. They're not the largest customer for the other people for whom Apple is the largest customer. And so they have not been able to deliver in the same way Apple has. So when people go out to replace their phone, there's, you know, last season's model from this, or here's the brand new iPhone. And then they're the carrier subsidies. It's, it's crazy trying to keep up. It, it's the same thing as trying to figure out like, why did Apple stock go up today? Or why did Apple stock go down today? Lots of people will say, well, here's the reason and it, it, that reason may be a contributing reason, but there may be four other things going on that we don't think about because we're not, you know, that, that we're not in that business. We're not as well versed. See also why iPhone sales went up. Did iPhone sales go up because Samsung wasn't able to deliver? Did iPhone sales go up because of 5G? Did iPhone sales go up because of the second round of 5G? And so nobody wanted to get the first one, but everybody wanted the second one. Who knows? I mean, iPhone is practically a force all on its own at this point, and yet one day it won't be, probably because it'll be replaced by AR. That's the thing that's fascinating to me. We're at the place now where, I can't remember who it was, somebody, it might have been Bill Gates, said something's going to replace the iPod. Something is going to replace the iPod. It's going to be a converged device and something's going to replace the iPod. And I knew lots of smart people who followed Apple who thought that Bill Gates was high because nothing's going to replace the iPod. Well, it turns out, yeah, something's going to replace the iPod and it's going to be the iPhone that's going to be made by Apple. Something's going to replace the iPhone one day. Um, probably at this point, I'd be willing to bet it's going to be something that's uh, produced by Apple. Probably the AR thing. Man, I, you you know, you just say like two words, Chuck, and I go nuts. I go, I go so far off the map. I'm sorry, man. Yeah, oh. iPhone or no work from home. That's what it was. Home. Work from home. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. See, I've been doing that since 2006. So it's like you know, oh yeah, work from home. I hear that's a thing that people are starting to do now. Yeah, yeah. I, I know for you, it's not a. I mean, we should be calling you as a consultant on how to set up work from home. Um, no, I had a friend who threatened to do that, and I was like, "Yeah, no, I'm the worst. You know, I, I keep weird hours. I don't have a specific place where I work." I'm a nightmare as far as work from home. I, I would be the poster child for how not to do it properly, except that I just keep doing it. That's that's the one thing, I think. Mm, yeah, you know, I, I I would challenge that. I think, you know, it works for you. And that's that's what worries me on some of the things I do see. You know, this is how you work from home. You sit in front of the camera, mm -hmm. you, you know, sit upright. And uh, no, I mean, I, yeah, there are times that I'll take a laptop and go to the sofa or you know, yeah. keep a little bit weirder hours just because it suits me and, <coughs> pardon me, and I don't have to, you know, worry about certain things the way I did mm -hmm. before. I still have to be on call, you know, during business hours, and that's no problem at all. But um, it's just, it, it, it's a different thing. And again, you you may like it, but I have the luxury of no no kids, no animals, nobody else in the house. And that is a big, big factor for so many folks. So Sure, sure. Ken, you've been extremely generous with your time. Really, really appreciate it. Um, I hope we gave some folks uh, some a few things to think about, maybe shed a little bit of light on things that have happened this year. And I don't know. We'll see what happens as we move forward, because that's all we can do. Do I... <laughs> That's um, all I I'm, got. You say that, and it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. I want to make sure I give you a chance though to plug everything that uh, everything else you do because I know that you have a couple projects uh, that are longstanding, and we never know what else you're going to get into. 
Yeah, right now the things that I would send people to are um, Mac OS Ken and The Checklist. The Checklist is a show that I started doing a little over five years ago now with the guys from Secure Mac, uh, makers of MacScan 3. And um, they're a great bunch of guys in sort of the same way of the Apple TV Plus doing the great stories can change the world thing. What that show is about is trying to make sure that everybody is as... <clears throat> safe as they can possibly be. It is sponsored by a program, I mean, by a, by a, an antivirus software maker, but, you know, we don't say buy this. I mean, we actually do say buy it. There's one ad in the thing where we say buy it, but we just want to make sure that everybody is safe. So run a good anti-malware, you know, solution. And whichever one is the best one for you is the best one for you. Uh, practice safe password hygiene and things like that. We're, we're very much a consumer-based, uh, consumer-oriented, average user um, security show. So that one comes out every Thursday, um, not next week because holiday, or not this week rather because holiday. But you can find out more at securemac.com slash checklist. And the other thing is Mac OS Ken, which turns 16 in January. And uh, it is daily Apple news and news related to Apple news. And uh, I'd love it to be checked that out too. So those would be the two things I would say right now, Mac OS Ken and the checklist. Great. And I'm going to put a plug in for both of them because if you want a, a really great perspective on Apple News every single day from someone that um, really studies it and pays attention to it, this is a show you want to listen to. And the checklist I personally really like because it doesn't get too geeky at any given time. You know, it's good, practical, actionable advice on how to improve your privacy and security. And that, you know, I, the, 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 the geeky stuff is fun for some of us, um, but most people mm -hmm. I don't think it is for. You know, it's, it's not, I don't really care how it, how it works. I just tell me how not to get hacked. And that's what the checklist does 98% yeah. of the time. So, yeah. That Great. is, that is absolutely our goal. And I'm glad to hear it's working for you because that's, that's, that's that's the goal. Yeah. Well, I'll have links in the show notes to both shows, so you can uh, go over and subscribe to them right away and not miss any more of Ken Ray ever. I'm going to say <laughs> oi again. I'm going to do it. <laughs> Ken, thanks so much. Happy, happy New Year. I hope you have a, a great uh, celebration for the rest of the holiday, and we will head into 2022 and see what happens. Thank you very much, Chuck, for having me. I appreciate it. And uh, Happy New Year to you. Thank you. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. Hope you're having a great holiday. Um, we will see you again soon on Mac Voices. As always, thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for show notes and to connect with Chuck on social media. Get involved in our Facebook group or like our Facebook page and get more out of your Apple tech with Mac Voices Magazine free on Flipboard and on the web. And if you find value in it all, consider supporting us through either our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash macvoices or by making a one-time donation via the PayPal link on our front page and in the show notes of each episode. You will join these fine people who help bring you Mac Voices. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com Bandwidth provided by CashFly at CashFly.com.